Hello, welcome back. Um, today I thought I would share with you the quilt top that I showed in my workroom video. Do you think you'd be interested in seeing me do the whole process of deciding how to quilt it and maybe go into a bit of history on the fabric? I'd be more than happy to do that. I think I'm going to do that. That would make a really nice video actually. So today I'm going to do the video in a slightly different format. We'll try this out, see how this works. So we'll have a little look at the quilt itself and talk about how to date it and then somewhere maybe in the middle but to break it up a bit I want to come and talk to you about some plans and stuff that I have been working on and then I'll get into the quilt design how I've chosen the design how some of the things I found out have influenced the design and if that sounds like something that you'd be interested in carry on watching and remember you can skip ahead to whichever bits we'll put the timestamps in the description okay look I'm in the camera look Look, yeah, here we go. This is the quilt laid out on my bed, um, which is a European king size. It gives you an idea of the size of the quilt. Now I've actually got it round the other way. That is actually the width, and then I've got the length going that way, just because it, it means you can see more of the fabric. It was easier to lay it out flat but it actually goes around the other way and in fact I think what I might do is is turn it around to show you now you've had a good look at that. So this is the quilt the right way around so the longest side running top to bottom and I just realized that actually it isn't I think this is the top here but I'm not going to turn it around again it's quite a faff to climb over all the lighting but now you can see the overview there is actually a pattern in it. Now remember that this quilt was bought the top, it's just a quilt top and obviously that's what the video is about today, is how I'm going to decide what to do with it, how to quilt it, you know, how to be sensitive to its age. And in the video where I first showed you this, I had thought it was 1950s, maybe 1940s, at a push 1930s. Well, wow. it just goes to show how wrong I was. I've spent <laughs> several days looking at this quilt now and I have photographed every single one of these different fabrics. So here you can see really clearly that there is a pattern. So that's the central square. That is about 12 or 13 inches square. I haven't measured everything yet but that gives you an idea. And then surrounding that there are looks to be about four inch squares going all the way around there and then around that some of them are square that's not that's not the ones on the corners are mostly square and I think they're about five inches square and you can see where there wasn't very much fabric but whoever made this obviously loved it so much that they've put little bits in there's only two bits of that in the whole quilt and the interesting thing is is um They've tried to balance it quite well. So over here you've got like a sort of clover leaf on a beigey, warm beige background next to a red with a beige pattern in it. And then over here you've got the same two fabrics next to each other. Just try and balance it up. And then over here you've got the teal, that really heavy teal. And it's here as well. And then it's actually in all four of the corners, but you can't see that one really. And having spent so long looking at the fabric, I have now determined that it isn't 1950s, it isn't 1940s, it's actually 1930s. I'll get the fabric swatches up and I'll talk you through why I've come to that conclusion. So I've taken photographs of what I thought was all the fabrics, but having laid them out on a little swatch board for you, I'm aware that we're missing about another 10 which gives you an idea of how many fabrics were used in the original quilt i haven't actually even counted what's up on this swatch board now i've laid them out into two so you've got all of the pinks of which there are 18 or 19 we're not sure if there might be another duplicate in there it's quite hard to tell unless you've got the fabric side by side so i decided to try and date this quilt and i originally thought it was 1950s i don't know why i thought it was 1950s but i just did i started looking up for images online of vintage fabrics and I found an absolutely brilliant website called the vintage dancer Com. I'll put a link in the description. Absolutely phenomenal. You can literally put in 1930s fabrics and on each decade she has a fashion colour grid. So I started looking at the 1950s, thought no, 
those colours are completely wrong. So I thought, okay, 1940s, this is the 1940s grid. Also completely wrong. This one, this is the 1930s fashion colour grid. And whilst these are a lot more, these are all plain for a start and very saturated, but you can see straight away, 1930s it is. And then I started reading about what she was talking about. She talks about saturated pastels. And I think you could definitely say that these are saturated pastels. And also um, quite a lot of tonal prints on a background colour. So if you had pink, you might have a tonal print of red. Well, if you look at all the number of pinks that we've got, I don't know how many have got red printing on them, but I think it's most of them. So with that in mind, I am fairly certain that this quilt top was collect all the fabrics were collected in the 1930s. If you go onto the second swatch block with all the different prints and the different colours, I've tried to lay them out in the same fabric but different the same print sorry but different colorways and it's really interesting how many the whoever it was that made this has been able to get their hands on bear in mind these there weren't any quilt shops then <laughs> all these fabrics were for either dressmaking or making curtains so the first line that you can see on the left hand side with the kind of checks i think those are probably more intended for things like aprons and what they called um i think they called washables in america i don't know what the terminology is here for that time period but these are things that wouldn't be surface cleaned they would actually be laundered in you know the usual way of doing laundry so these are quite heavy duty prints that wouldn't show the muck and the dirt and what have you so i think those are apron prints or cap you know for making your cap as well and then the next row that we have the top three the first three so the burgundy the black and then the sort of tan color that are actually all the same print but on completely different backgrounds that fabric has got Got quite a different texture to it and I think it's a lightweight curtaining and then the next line the uh, four of a sort of a elongated kind of paisley hook thing that really fits in with a lot of the sort of ethnic -y style prints and things that were very fashionable in the late 1920s going into the 1930s and then the others are just you know sort of everything else in between apparently stripes and polka dots have been in forever and I also think there are a couple of fabrics although looking at this grid I've managed to not photograph them <laughs> that I think are from the 1910s or earlier there's a few bits that have obviously come from a I don't know someone's scrap basket somewhere but the really interesting thing is with the different colors um of the different colorways of the same print I'm wondering how this woman presumably it was a woman that made it how she got hold of them did she go to the draper's shop? Did she say, hey, have you got any pattern books, any swatch books I can have? Like we all still do now. And she's ended up with all these different fabrics and different colorways. Obviously really liked pink. Those were the ones that have been featured the most. For your delectation and enjoyment, here is all of the fabrics. So now we've dated the quilt as accurately as possible. And we've talked about you know, the draper swatches and all of that kind of thing. Now we're gonna get into the how to design the quilting. So in Welsh quilts, nearly all Welsh quilts that I have ever seen, they approach the quilting as though it is one continuous piece. So just like you would see the whole cloth quilt, I'll put a, a link in the description. I did a whole cloth quilt last year. You'll see the quilting all over that. When someone's pieced something, the quilting is done in the same way, not like how we do it now or generally tend to do it, where you might choose something to quilt in the squares or you might choose to do something that just, you know, highlights that square in the middle or do some zigzag things, whatever it happens to be, we would generally be um, dictated to by the piecing of the fabric. But Welsh quilts don't do that. And this is a Welsh quilt top. It was found here, not far from where I live. So I think the right thing to do is to do it in the Welsh tradition. Given that we now know this is most likely mid 1930s, I want to revise the original plan that I came up for at the quilting plan. I will show you what I came up with first of all, but I think we're gonna go for something that's a little bit more 1930s. So I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about where this channel's going and 
some plans that I've got. There's still one plan that I was hoping to announce at the end of January, which um, it's taking a little bit longer to just get all the confirmations through for that. So just be patient, it's worth it. The thing that I will be announcing, I am hoping to vlog, do a little vlog video and put it up on Kofi. I know I've dropped quite a lot of hints along the time that I've been actually doing this channel for like the last year or so and I've kept saying oh when I do Patreon, when I do Patreon, when I do Patreon. My initial intention was to start Patreon when I had got to a thousand subscribers and started to be monetized by the Google AdSense thing which is why you see adverts and I actually spent some time looking into that and realized that actually I don't really need to use Patreon. I know it's a great tool for some people, especially people that uh, would probably do a bit more live streaming. I'm gonna stick with Kofi. I've already had um, several donations for the price of a coffee to support the channel. Um, some people have been more generous than that, um, which is so kind. And I said all along that what I would do when I had received enough donations um, and the cash that I get from the, the adverts, I would buy some decent lighting. Well, thank you. I have bought decent lighting. It's not here yet. It's on order. It's on its way. So even if you just want to watch my videos and you don't want to help on Kofi, that's fine. You don't have to. I want this to always be, you know, free at the point of access type thing. I really want it to be something that is accessible to pretty much anyone with a mobile phone to, to watch this channel. The adverts that get put in along the way, I have managed to cobble together enough cash to buy two really nice lights and when they arrive I'm going to do like a little YouTuber unboxing. So thank you just for watching the adverts and thank you for all of your support on Kofi. I've now unlocked um, a facility that you can do a monthly subscription if you want to and I will be doing some sort of rewards and extras and things like that as time goes on. I just need to work out how to do those sort of things. I think I'll be putting up early access to the vlog that I mentioned. I can also uh, send people links to PDFs. Um, so, you know, that will be something that I'd, I'd really like to set up and, but obviously I don't know if anybody knows about doing PDFs, you have to have a, a designated website to host it. So that's something that's coming as well. So there's lots of exciting things coming and um, I just wanted to sort of catch you up a bit, but not make a designated video because hopefully, you know, if you, if you were interested in like the channel as a whole, you've been watching this. Anyway, let's get back to the main video. measured the quilt and it measures 83 inches by 96 and a half so it's not square it's a good bed size you saw it actually on the bed um, what it looked like the first thing we need to do before we decide any quilting patterns or anything like that is to work out how it's going to be finished I know that sounds like a silly thing to think about now but these are 1930s fabrics a lot, a lot of the 1930s fabric reproductions you see are the kind of fun prints, you know, the, a lot more white than these. The sort of things people had play suits and children's clothes and that kind of thing out of. I'm not going to be able to find anything to bind this with that would go. The only thing I have thought about was to use a 1830s reproduction fabric. I have some that I bought from Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts years ago. And some of these seem really quite reminiscent of those patterns. But again, I decided not to do that because the only place you would see them would be in the binding. There's no way of adding in anything. 
So then I thought, well, how about doing the Welsh method, which is where you turn this side in and then you turn the backing fabric in and then you stitch it along like that. And I, I didn't really fancy doing that because it's a fiddle, basically. <laughs> I mean, it looks, it's an interesting method of finishing it. It would eradicate that problem, but I just don't fancy it. So what I have decided to do is, I don't know if you can see, if I put that like that, these sides aren't even anyway. I don't know if the person that made this was planning on adding more bits in or what they were going to do, but all of this needs to be trimmed off to make it straight. So I thought, well, if I'm trimming some off anyway, why don't I trim off enough, so about two and a half inches, to make the binding? And then the binding is the same fabrics as the quilt. So that's what I'm going to do. So I wanted to put the original size on there, and then I will measure it again when I've chopped all the bits off. So literally what I will do is um, cut off two and a half inches all the way around, and that should be plenty for the binding. So, and then I'll put that on one side and not lose it. <laughs> Definitely not lose it. Um, before I can do the cutting though, this has been hand stitched. Let's find a darker fabric so you can see the stitching. The whole quilt has been hand stitched like that. You see that line of white stitching along there? All of it, every single seam. So I can't cut through this unless I do something to it first, which means I need to go to the sewing machine, stitch about four inches along there on the sewing machine so that when I come to cut through it it's not the stitching's not going to come undone. It might seem a bit of a kind of you know not the correct thing to do with a old or vintage piece or soon to be antique piece. There isn't really another way of doing it short of measuring exactly hand stitching and then hand stitching back that way. It's worth a lot to me and the history part of it I've been really good and archived all the swatches which you've seen. So really what I do with it now is about it being useful and elevating it back to the original person's intention, the, the lady that made it. the quilting. Originally when I was thinking of what to do with this quilt, I used this book um, because it's got such a good uh, library of quilt and patterns at the back and how to construct them. So this is Making Welsh Quilts, The Textile Tradition That Inspired the Amish by Mary Jenkins and Claire Claridge. And at the back there is a fantastic section of how to design all the motifs and what they're called, how to construct them uh, and it makes a lot of references to what people would have had on hand to uh, design their own quilts. So they would have used tea plates, dinner plates uh, for circles, some people were very good at using um, a string with a pencil on to do the circle and I had hoped to show you that today but if I actually get to that stage this video is going to be about three days long so I think I'm going to do another video to show me actually marking the quilt and then starting the quilting and that kind of thing because I think that would be really interesting but so I looked through this book and I was looking at all these different designs and looking at the various medallions, uh, border prints, see all these different borders, um, simple Welsh trail and I really wanted to use designs that were traditional for Welsh quilts but not exclusive to Welsh quilts. The thing that is quite different with Welsh quilts particularly is the practice of using the quilt top as though it was a whole cloth quilt, so as though it was a continuous piece of fabric rather than something that's pieced with designs on. So nearly all Welsh quilts that I have seen, nearly all, not all, start with a central medallion. So I worked out that I wanted it to cover 
not only the central square, so there's a square here that I've started doing the measuring, only so I can roughly block this out. So the central medallion, I wanted that to cover that whole section there. And then I was thinking about filling it in with um, the cross hatching, you know, really good use of space. And then using this, the simple Welsh trail, I worked out how to, to draw that out and then put some hearts in and and then I thought it would be really nice to repeat the leaves and I kind of went a bit mad with it. It's a nice quilting design, you can see this will be repeated up here. And these things are all open-ended on how big they are. Because another thing about Welsh quilts is um, like the ones with a lot of quilting on like this tended to be made by actual professional quilters. There isn't a tradition for quilting bees in, in Wales. It was very much seen as a, prof a profession and so women would travel round and either stamp out quilt tops for people. Some people were known for stamping the design on so that the lady of the house or the, you know, the farmer's wife, whoever it was, could then quilt it at her leisure or they would actually stay at the farm or the you know wherever they were staying not only do the quilt top if it was going to be using pieces of chintz or what have you but then stay stamp the quilt and then pop it onto a frame and actually quilt it in situ so not all the designs they weren't decided you know that the whole quilt top wasn't completely me measured out or the design wasn't decided right from the beginning but I have to do that on mine because I don't have a quilt frame so it's quite hard to mark a quilt once it's already got its three layers basted together or, or um, tacked together. That's why I've left these sort of things open-ended so I am still going to do a central medallion of some description and then probably what I will do is start from the outside edge and measure in to do the first border and then measure in again to do another wider border and I would actually like to do something more curvy than this I think and then all the spaces in between once those are worked out I can fill in with this cross hatching and that will answer that question. I like this design and I think it would be really effective but having then discovered that it's the quilt is actually 1930s I decided I wanted to do something a bit more kind of art deco, something like this with the half circles and then the radiating out like a little fan type thing. I think the two motifs on this pattern that I've done that I will kill, keep are the central medallion and then each corner will be a square with a quarter of a circle in. So I think what I'll show you now is probably cutting off the binding and then we'll measure the final thing and then we'll see how we get on. So the hardest thing about this is there are no straight lines to follow. All of the pieces are uneven. They end with, you know, some are longer than others, some have got dinks out of them. What I've done is I've tried to make this line a little straighter and try and follow that. There's there's so many things that could go wrong at this point. What else can I do? I've got to decide where my straight edge is. To be honest, you can see this has not been cut straight anyway. So I think the optical illusion of, of a straight edge will be absolutely fine. If I did that two and a half inches, there's gonna be some bits that are missing underneath. I'm actually going to cut off three inch strip, I think. I might even cut off a three and a half inch strip. And then I have to do this off, off of each side. I think I'm going to have to go with that, so hopefully this will work out okay. <laughs> it's going to be straighter than it is now, so I am using a rotary cutter and I've already stitched through all of the ends. So rather than undo this and worry about it later, I'm going to cut it now so I know it's right. You can see how much is missing under there. So this is the two and a half inch bit now. And this way, by not unrolling it first, I'm not gonna have to try and get it all back together again. So I've got my first piece of binding cut. So now I can undo it. And then the, the thing that I anticipate being the hardest is not cutting the same side twice. <laughs> so the way I get it in position, I've done this edge here. So now I want to do, go around the corner and do this edge. You can see again, there's quite a lot missing in places. And all I do is put it right sides together and kind of hope for the best. I know you can't see it at the moment, I'm shaking it out on the floor to see where it wants to sit naturally. So that's where we want to cut off here. So I can see straight away part of the problem. I'm 
going to come right up to this seam line here. What I'll have to do is take it out so there's about just over a quarter of an inch, which means that down here the binding might not come up big enough, but it's easy enough to sort out on the ironing board. But I think that's the best I can do. If I cut it down here, yeah, it starts to get very complicated. The best thing to do would probably be to unpick that entire bit and use it. I don't want to do that. So, Especially not as I've looked very closely. You saw me on the sewing machine. So I've seen all of these, what the, how these seams are done and they're running backstitch. That's the next strip. That's off of one of the short sides. I'll just gently put that out of the way so I don't cut into it. And so I need to turn this into a strip of binding. Okay, so there's the next piece of binding. Cut. If you want to see how to um, bind a quilt, I've got um, a video, uh, I think it's January last year, of how to bind a quilt. I'll show you in that what to do with these strips. all been cut I thought it would be really interesting to at least start some of the marking out and show you from descriptions I've read how people actually would do it if they didn't have their own templates. I would love to get my hand on some original quilting templates but in my 30 something or other years of being interested in quilts, quilt making, quilt history, all of that, I've never even seen any, none. I think they were a bit like uh, tin stencils from what uh, descriptions I've read. If anyone knows, I would love to know. I know this is roughly square, and I also know I want to leave enough to stitch the binding on, which will be a quarter of an inch here. And then I'd like a little space, so, you know, a little pause be before the binding. So I'm gonna measure what that would be. So I've got a quarter of an inch for the binding, maybe an inch, would that be about right? Have the quilting end about an inch away. I can, if it looks empty afterwards, once I put the binding on, I can always do like a line of quilting in between. That can always be filled in. And also, that's traditional as well with Welsh quilts, is um, often the, the designs are echoed. So you'll have one line and then you'll have a, another line around it. So if it's circles, like a concentric circle. I think we're gonna go with an inch and then I need to mark it. We could use a dressmaker's chalk pencil. I would say this will be more successful than using Taylor's chalk. Taylor's chalk's going to come out quite quickly, too quickly. And then I think it would be really nice to have a border. I know you can't really see this, but trust me, there is a line there. So if we had a border about maybe five inches. I know Prim do a multicolour chalk pen. I can't find it. There's a, anyway, there's a retractable pencil and you can put all these different colours in. These chalks are a little bit more permanent than you might want on some quilts, but I think it would probably be okay to give this a, a wash afterwards if it doesn't come out. And when I find the pencil, that's probably what I will use because I know there's a bit of a longevity to it. You could also use a water-soluble marker. And then I've also got an extra fine cartridge pencil, which I've never used, so. Oh, it's like chalk. That might show up between the blue and this one. I might be able to show you today. So you see there's a blue line there and a blue line there. So now I thought we'd have a go at marking on a corner design. Literally what they did, they raided their kitchens to get a range of plates. So either we could put the whole thing on and draw a circle round, or we could do a sort of a generous thing like that. Or you could just do a quarter. You could probably put some um, masking tape on this on the back. <laughs> I don't think they have masking tape, but you could if you wanted to line things up a bit. But let's just let's just go by eye. Let's let's do it. So let's just draw a bit of a circly thing going on. Quarter circle, and then I could use a very big one. Try and do the same thing again. This one's really nice. It's got a wavy edge, so I might use this when I come to mark it out and quilt it properly. It's got a really cute wavy edge. That's not bad. See, it's got like a little wavy edge there. Ah, actually, I think that's how you get it even. I think you start with the big one and then work your way back from the line. And then all you'd need is some sort of straight edge to divide this in half and start doing the little fan pattern. Now, I actually want to do mine in the corner. I don't want to do them up there. I want that all to be lines, I think. 
And I am going to cheat because I've got a 45 degree angle on here. So I can get my ruler in the right place. So I know I'm actually going to divide it in half. And I will say I've never done this before. This is, this is not how I've ever marked out a quilt ever before. So I'm actually pretty impressed how straightforward it is. We've got the one inch and then the three inches. That, so that would be a border there. And then I've got four rows of different round things. And then I divided that up and put those in. So already you've got something that's looking quite Art Deco, may I say. That's quite impressive. And also, um, something that was really super easy to mark. I didn't need a template. I didn't need a stencil. I didn't have to copy a pattern, anything. I have literally just made that up myself. So it shows that it is perfectly possible to do this with a you know, straight edge of some description and some plates. The one thing I would say on here is where the plates are different sizes and the curve is different and what have you, you could go in and make it right to follow the curvature of the other plates pretty easily. And honestly, once that's stitched in, no one would know. I've just made it a bit more pointy there, and a bit more curved there. So I think on mine, when I come to do it, I will use the plate method, and I think I'm probably gonna film the whole thing. Have a go. I, I think this is super fun. You could, you could replicate this really easily. You really don't need very much in the way of drafting skills or quilting skills or anything. I, I mean, I could take a pattern from this. I don't know, is that something anybody would be interested in? I could. We've got all the fabrics, got a fabric archive, so you could match things a little to that or go with the colorways or not. I mean, let's face it. I mean, if it didn't have so much pink in it, would it <laughs> would it hold together as a quilt color-wise? I mean, there's some really, really interesting choices and they're all in the quilt. This is not, it's not been chosen to make a project, has it? This is what someone's got kicking about, definitely. So, I hope you have enjoyed this video. I hope you've enjoyed the journey. I certainly have. It's been absolutely fascinating. From something that I picked up 10, 12 years ago, that lived for a long time on a shelf. I rescued it, didn't know what to do with it. Then it's been on my sofa and I was just, actually I really, really want to do something nice with it. So I'm so glad when I did the workroom kind of tour, I just thought, yeah, this would be really, really good because it's made me look at it. I don't mean just look at it and go, ooh, isn't it pretty? I mean, it's made me look at it. I've looked at the stitching. I feel like I almost know the lady that made this. I just wish I could find out some more information. I, I am absolutely convinced that some of these are swatches from Draper's, you know, a Draper's shop, a fabric shop back in the day. The, the number of fabrics that are just different colorways of the same design, utterly fascinating. And isn't it brilliant that people were doing that back then, just like we do it now. But it did, it really, really made me look at it. I am just so chuffed to bits, the things that I have found out and I've shared with you. I have to say, uh, thanks to the Blimey, what is she called? The Vintage Dancer? I'll put a link in the description. It's not an affiliate link, but my goodness, if you want to know about fabric, that woman, what she hasn't collected, put on there, written about, and all the rest of it, it was brilliant. Because I didn't just look at 1930s fabric, I looked at 1950s fabric, and then I looked at 1940s fabric, and then I looked at 1930s fabric, and then I looked at 1920s, which made me be able to give it a more of an accurate date. I think there are things that are older, like this one. The fact that it is a mercerized cotton, so it's been ironed basically, it's been ironed very hot so it's squished, it makes it slightly shiny. I think that's 1910s and some of the things might actually go up to the 1950s but I couldn't say with any certainty. Isn't there a sort of wonderful serendipity about this quilt being purchased sort of 17 miles away from where I live? Guessing it was made not far from that given that it came out of a drawer. Anyway, thanks for joining me and I'll see you again soon. Bye!